The Bataan Death Marches, the building of the Burma Railway, and the Hell Ships. The atrocities committed by the Japanese on enemy POWs are infamous. But what about the flip side? What was the fate of the Japanese soldiers captured by the Allies? In this video, we delve into their stories. During the Second World War, Japanese soldiers earned a reputation for never surrendering. Their tenacity and will to keep fighting under hopeless conditions became legendary among Allied troops. The Chinese, Soviet, US and Commonwealth forces put this down to fanaticism. They believed the regular Japanese soldier was desperate to throw away his life for the Emperor. In Japan, this thinking was constantly reinforced. Soldiers were brutalized in training and taught that their lives belonged to the Emperor by a government-sponsored indoctrination program. From 1941, each soldier was given a pocket copy of the Senjinkun, the instructions for the battlefield. A passage from this short, simple text reads, Never live to experience shame as a prisoner. By dying, you will avoid leaving a stain on your honor. This concept wasn't limited to Japanese soldiers, they believed it applied to captured enemy soldiers too. Coupled with brutal Japanese military life, this thinking paved the way for the Japanese army to commit the worst atrocities of the war. However, unthinking loyalty and fear of shame probably weren't the main factors that kept Japanese soldiers from surrendering in large numbers, as other armies did. It's more likely the average Japanese soldier was far more worried about his fate if captured than going against the Senjinkun in his pocket. Japanese soldiers expected to be killed on sight if they surrendered to the Allies, no matter which force. If they were lucky enough to avoid an immediate bullet, they assumed their captors would treat them the same way Japanese units treated POWs, horrendously. Believing they would surely be tortured or killed if they surrendered, Japanese soldiers felt they had no choice but to fight or commit suicide. Similarly, medical officers sometimes killed their own patients for fear of what the Allies might do to them. But the worst part is these fears weren't unfounded. Before May 1944, most Japanese soldiers that surrendered to US forces were shot on sight. Allied soldiers, particularly American soldiers, believed the Japanese to be fanatical and expected every surrender to be a ruse. Earlier in the war, some surrendering Japanese soldiers concealed grenades or knives with which they attacked their captors. One famous example was the Gautage patrol in the early phase of the Guadalcanal campaign. 25 marines, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Gautage, were annihilated in an ambush while they attempted to accept a Japanese unit's surrender. A marine watching from afar recounted, the idea of taking prisoners was swept from our minds. It was too dangerous. Every surrendering soldier was seen as a potential threat. Additionally, the Allied soldiers' habit of taking battle souvenirs led the Japanese to believe that, if not death, they faced mutilation. Bones, and especially skulls from dead Japanese soldiers, were prized by US forces. In Life magazine, the caption, Arizona war worker writes her Navy boyfriend a thank you note for the Jap skull he sent her, appeared next to an image of a young woman and a skull. President Roosevelt even caused controversy when he returned a gifted letter opener made from a Japanese soldier's arm bone, calling for its proper burial. In May 1944, US High Command initiated programs to educate their soldiers about the benefits of enemies surrendering instead of fighting to the death. They were fairly successful, and numbers of Japanese POWs grew substantially. Though, generally speaking, Chinese and Soviet forces continued to take few, if any, prisoners until the end of the war. The Japanese soldiers captured before mid-1944 tended to fit into two groups. The first group, containing the vast majority, comprised Koreans, Taiwanese, Manchurians, and other peoples colonized by Imperial Japan. Often from labor units, these men were far less keen to die for the emperor than homegrown Japanese soldiers. The second group was made up of primarily soldiers that had been severely wounded in battle or knocked unconscious. Left for dead by their comrades, they could not resist capture. 
Once prisoners had been secured, they were moved to POW camps. The US military didn't feel it had the capability to support POWs in the Pacific, so they outsourced the operation to Australia and New Zealand. In return for extra war material from Lendley Steels, the Aussies and Kiwis set up POW camps and provided the guards. This is where most of the Japanese POWs ended up. However, a small number of POWs selected for their intelligence value were brought to specially built camps in the continental United States. After they arrived, the POWs were sent to a medical facility in Tracy, California, where they were fed and screened for tropical diseases. Many suffered from parasitic infections and were in the early or medium stages of starvation. Once pronounced fit in Tracy, POWs were relocated to camps at the nearby Byron Hot Springs and Fort Hunt. These camps were specially provisioned for Japanese POWs. Japanese food appeared on the menu alongside local fare and the men were encouraged to socialize. Each was assigned his own Japanese American interrogator with whom he chatted informally for a few hours each day. These interrogators quickly discovered that Japanese POWs could not be forced to divulge secrets in the traditional ways, but had another weakness. The mere suggestion that a POW's family might be notified of his capture was enough to get even the toughest men talking. Confident they weren't going to be killed, the captured soldiers feared shame above all. Good treatment and some hidden microphones loosened enough lips for US military intelligence to get all they needed from the POWs. Many believed they had already turned their back on Japan and were, consequently, more than willing to help. Some even volunteered to fight for the Americans. But for the regular grunts, the guys who didn't know anything useful, things were quite different. One of the largest camps holding Japanese POWs was located in Kaura, New South Wales. In August 1944, 1,104 Japanese POWs were secured in Camp B of No. 12 Prison Compound. This camp was guarded by militiamen of the 22nd Garrison Battalion. The militia was composed of men otherwise unfit for service. Some were young and had health conditions, but more were old veterans. They were armed with an assortment of Great War era rifles and a few machine guns. Discontent had been building in the camp for some time. Facilities were in accordance with the Geneva Conventions, however, cultural differences and racism between guards and POWs caused serious friction. On August 4th, the militiamen heard the POWs organizing a breakout. To stop it, they planned to move all POWs below Lance Corporal rank to another camp. This accelerated the Japanese plans. At 2am that night, the prisoners staged a mass breakout. On the sound of a bugle, a mass of prisoners armed with improvised knives and clubs charged the fence and began cutting their way through. Privates Ben Hardy and Ralph Jones manned a Vickers machine gun close to the breakout site and, after warnings, opened fire into the crowd. They gunned down over a hundred Japanese soldiers before the mob broke through and charged them. Just before they were overrun, the men pulled the bolt from their weapon and threw it away, rendering it useless. They were then hacked to pieces. 334 prisoners escaped, but all were recaptured within a week of the breakout. Many had chosen to stay behind during the confusion and settle scores, as many Japanese POWs were discovered to have been killed by fellow inmates. Several more committed suicide. All in all, 234 POWs died as a result of the breakout and a further 108 were wounded. Hardy and Jones were both posthumously awarded the George Cross, the highest Commonwealth award for bravery not under fire. The Cowra breakout was the largest and bloodiest prison escape of the Second World War. When Emperor Hirohito announced that the war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage, millions of soldiers surrendered to the Allies en masse. In Mongolia, Manchuria, and China, 1.8 million soldiers of the Japanese army were captured by the Soviet Union and sent to labor camps. They were gradually repatriated from these eastern gulags, but some continued to toil until 1950, five years after the war had ended. That was the surprising story of Japanese POWs and their treatment by the Allies in the Second World War. But what do you think? Did you know that most Japanese soldiers feared shame more than the enemy? Do you think it's messed up that a soldier sent a skull to his girlfriend? Had you heard of the Kaura breakout? Let us know all that and more in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.